Sunday, Sunday, Sunday school. Sunday, 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 Sunday. Hey there, TSSG family. Welcome to the fall quarter of the International Sunday School lesson. This is our second lesson in the quarter with me, your second Sunday, Sunday School reviewer, Pastor Sandra Candler, wafer. Evangelist Wayne Nell, that Sunday School girl, has us on a new and exciting journey this year, and I hope you're going to come along with us. Also, let us know in the comments if this is your first time and you're new in our community and allow our community to show you some love. You can also press that thumbs up like button and subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any of this amazing content. Now, let's get into our lesson. This lesson title is Jesus Silences Critics. My thoughts on the title was simply that if Jesus had critics, I'm going to have critics. And the scripture this week is coming from Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Let's pray and get into it. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this time of review, Lord, of your most holy and precious word. We thank you, Lord, that you're with each and every one of us, every minute of every second of every day, Father God. Thanking you, God, for your truly for your blessings that you have poured out on each of us. Now, Lord, as we sit at your feet and study your word, bless us now with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as only you can, O God. And Lord, we'll be careful to thank you, to praise you, and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our background author, author is Luke, the namesake of this book and the book of Acts. He's a Gentile physician, and in his writings, he goes in with a physician's precision as he details the life and ministry of Christ, as told to him by eyewitnesses. Look for his specific details in the accounts of Jesus' life and ministry as you read his letters, what's written and what is not. He writes his letters to Theopolis, meaning his name means lover of God, to create an orderly and accurate account of Christ, the Messiah. We also know that Dr. Luke, who was named only three times in the New Testament, which are outside of his books, we know that he also traveled with the Apostle Paul. These religious leaders, the Pharisees, are challenging Jesus about the law of God. This is one of three accounts in Luke where we see the Pharisees and other religious leaders out to get Jesus. These Pharisees, these keepers of the law, were more concerned about keeping to the letter of the law than loving the people. They were some of the biggest breakers of the law themselves, but they were quick to condemn others, as we see in many of the accounts. In fact, their plotting to ensnare Jesus was in and of itself breaking the law. They were hypocrites. Pharisees were more caught up in their traditions and elevating themselves and ruling over the people. But that's not God's way. God elevates people over rules. Jesus is invited to eat with them on the Sabbath to try and catch him doing something wrong. We call that entrapment today. <laughs> Let's okay. read the scripture. Luke 14 verses 1 through 6. And it came to pass, as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him, which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering, spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Verse 4. And they held their peace, and he took him, and healed him, and let him go. And answering them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit, and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. Amen. So, as we get into verse 1. Dr. Luke describes to us the third time we see Jesus sharing a meal with Pharisees. As we read this account, 
we notice that they tried to entrap Jesus through their questions and their scenarios. But he still associates with them by having a meal with them in order to show them love, mercy, and a godly example. Let's this scripture, in comparison to other texts in Luke and the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, where the Pharisees are rebuking Jesus for eating with tax collectors and sinners, Jesus' response was, those who are well have no need of a physician, but it's those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, as he's eating with the Pharisees. Certainly the Pharisees thought of themselves as the righteous ones. But we see a little bit differently today. As chapter 14 opens with, and it came to pass, this tells us that there was some time period um, period of time that happened between Jesus's prayerful concern and weeping over Israel and the close of chapter 13 and being invited to this meal at the house of one of the chief Pharisees. Some consider Jesus a rabbi or a teacher. He would be an acceptable dinner guest among such distinguished Pharisees and other religious leaders. You had to be somebody important to be invited to this Sabbath meal, as the Pharisees did not associate with sinners, yet they invite Jesus on the Sabbath to have a meal with them. Now, a chief Pharisee is one that had risen or attained some level of wealth and prominence. They would have been from the tribe of Levi and well acquainted with and a very renowned teacher of the law and high ranking and a high ranking ranking member in the priesthood that served on the Sanhedrin. When it came to the Sabbath, there were rules that had rules that had rules about doing what they called work on the Sabbath, which was supposed to be the day of rest. The Sabbath began according to Leviticus 23 and 32 from evening to evening, you shall celebrate the Sabbath. When the sun goes down on Friday evening, Sabbath begins. The nation of Israel was told by God to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. This is modeled for them in creation. God also rested and declared the seventh day holy from Genesis 2. And in Exodus 20 and 8, they were reminded to keep the Sabbath holy. So to help the nation of Israel keep the law, however, the Pharisees desired to help them out a bit. So they instituted this complex and confusing laws of the Sabbath and commentaries to the law and commentaries to the commentaries about the law. A system of their own that was oppressive and legalistic. See the notes for some more details on this. But what was the Sabbath supposed to be? It was supposed to be a blessing to those who would observe it. Mark 2 and 27 says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It was not supposed to make people slaves to the Sabbath. It was supposed to be a day of rest in and with God. Even today, we need to continue making sure that we engage in some spiritually nourishing activities and not those things that drain us like the other six days of the week. Many may remember everything was closed, used to be closed on Sunday. Everything had to be done on Saturday. Cooking the Sunday dinner, getting your clothes ready for church. We even had what was called the Blue Law in the United States that prohibited, prohibited the sale of alcohol on Sundays to preserve the Sabbath. It was a pretty important day. Now, these Pharisees watched Jesus, meaning they were maliciously watching him with ill intent. They wanted to find fault in him. Once friends and family hear that you are attending church, you've given your life to Christ, or that you're a Christian, your watching begins. So we must remain diligent for those that are watching us. Will we mess up some days? Of course we will. But it's our actions after that separate us from the world. Now, in verse 2, it says, a certain man. That always means there's something particular about this person. The only way for this certain man to be at this Sabbath meal in the house of a chief Pharisee is to have been invited. 
could the Pharisees be that cruel to have invited this man as a plant to get Jesus to do something unlawful? Although the Pharisees followed Jesus for wrong reasons and did their best to be hostile toward him, they knew his character well enough to know that if a person came into his presence that was suffering, that Jesus would heal the person. This really allows us to see how treacherous the Pharisees could be, how desperate they are to stoop this low. Do they despise Jesus so much to mock another human? Do they love the law so much and the people, especially the ones that were suffering, so little? Now, dropsy, this is an illness and swelling of the tissue in the limbs and the face, usually a problem with major organs in the body. It was painful. As the swelling continued, it would leave a person needing help from others, and in those days, eventually dying from it. Today, we know it as edema. Many see the effects of it when we have too much salt in our diet, or if one of those major organs are having some challenges. Modern science today, though, has given us the ability to have medicine to help remove the excess water from the body. Many biblical scholars actually saw this man's affliction as representing the greed of the Pharisees and Israel. Just as with the disease, there was a constant thirst, although the body could not release the fluid. The Pharisees had a constant greed that caused them to want and seek out more wealth. Little did these religious leaders know what they chose to entrap Jesus with represented their own spiritual decline. Now Jesus begins to answer the unasked questions. Jesus knew exactly what they were doing and plotting. Even when they don't say it, thoughts are words to Christ. He knew their hearts even better than they knew he would heal someone in his presence. Jesus knew his people, but it seems his people did not know him. As he asked the questions, notice their response. They had nothing. They had gotten themselves on a double-edged sword. Either way they may have answered would not have been the result they wanted to make public. We don't want to tell anybody. Notice verse 3 starts, and Jesus answering. Dr. Luke didn't forget to write down the question. We see that there was no question. Jesus perceived what was in their hearts. As Jesus speaks to the lawyers, and these were not what you would think of judicial lawyers, they're the ones that were considered experts in the law of Moses or the Torah. All these extra laws that burdened the people just as heavily as Roman law taxed the people. Jesus came to right what was wrong, to heal the sick, and in this instance, teach mercy and love. He asked them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He wanted them to get to the heart of the problem, their hearts. Was the question about healing a man or was it about healing on the Sabbath? He also asked the same question in Luke 6 and 9. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? Each time Jesus is confronted by the Pharisees with challenges about healing on the Sabbath. Jesus takes the time to show them love and mercy, although they may not even recognize it. In John 2.24, we learn that Jesus knew all men. He knows those that are not genuine in their faith and character. He knew what was in their hearts, but yet he still loves them too, enough to extend his hand. So in verse 4, we see no one answered as they all held their peace. A yes answer would have violated all they had taught and accused people of about the Sabbath. A no answer would have caused them to look heartless towards the people. They had to hold their peace, lest they appear cruel and unmerciful and lose all respect among the people. Pharisees were all about the traditions that had been passed down Sometimes it was tradition that we get stuck in. It can become troublesome because we've done it for so long and don't think about it 
and it's become a way of life when we elevate the tradition and stop thinking about why we do it. We can get caught up in legalistic rituals that can stop us from moving towards God, and especially when it doesn't meet our expectations. That's what's happening with these religious leaders. They are stuck and can't move forward, even with God in the room with them. Jesus, with all compassion and love, healed the man and let him go. We can see this in the writing that the man was healed because he would have been swollen. A complete healing would have immediately been obvious. The word tells us that he was healed. And remember, in the summer, we studied a lot about the arrival of the kingdom of God. And healings were one of the indicators of its arrival. Did these men who were teachers of the law, scholars of the word of God, were they aware that the kingdom of God had arrived with Jesus and these signs that followed him, especially the healings, were an indication that the kingdom of God the kingdom of God had come. Were they so focused on having it their way, enjoying their status quo, that they missed the one they claimed to be waiting for, the one that they were supposed to be watchful for? Reminds me of the ten virgins who watched for the bridegroom and five were foolish and forgot their oil for the lamps. And when the bridegroom came, they got locked out because they weren't there. Notice Jesus continued the conversation with the religious leaders. They held their peace, and Jesus turned to heal the man and let him go. We can see the priority for Jesus in his actions. It wasn't about being right in the conversation. In that moment, it was about love, mercy, and compassion for the suffering man. That's our God who takes care of our needs. Jesus didn't try to prove a point, argue about healing on the Sabbath, his love for his people shone through his actions as he turns in compassion and heals the man. Jesus sends the man away. No need for him to stay among these people that merely used him as a pawn in a game of chess, as if he was expendable. He had suffered long enough as part of their cruel and evil plan. Jesus sends him to go on and celebrate his healing with people that love him and cherish him, those that have compassion for him. Jesus shows that he came to fulfill the law in showing mercy and healing the man of dropsy on the Sabbath. Now, the last two verses, the second question. Again, there's silence. Jesus answers a question that they were afraid to ask. So he asked them another question. But as we look closely at this question, we see that Jesus is seeking to appeal to the good that must be somewhere deep inside of them. As I studied it, I felt like there was at least one of these religious leaders that was getting what Jesus was doing and saying. If there was even one that was afraid to speak up, but in his heart, he was beginning to understand what Jesus was saying to them. The scales were maybe falling from his eyes, but he knew that if he said anything, they would put him out of the brotherhood. So he remained silent. And we do know that the Pharisee, there were Pharisees that secretly favored Jesus. If no one was getting it at all, wouldn't Jesus do what he told his disciples to do when they were not received? In Matthew 10 and 14, he says, whoever should not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake the dust from your feet. After Jesus asked them about saving their animals, they knew that the law allowed them to help. But how is it there was more mercy shown to an animal than to another human? Even if it was a child or a family member, would they help? Of course they would, to a point, because the law couldn't be broken. So Jesus is digging in to uncover that good that is yet on the inside of them. The religious leaders over the years put additional laws in place to help them keep the Sabbath. For example, they were only allowed to do enough on the Sabbath to save a life. So if something was life-threatening, they could do just enough to remove the threat, but no more. 
this was even part of how they plotted to ensnare Jesus. See, because the man with dropsy was not going to be was not going to immediately die of the, of the disease, so they could call what Jesus did work, thus breaking the law. The law said they could do just enough that allowed them to hang on until the Sabbath was over. How horrible could that be for someone depending on that situation they were in? Your child falls into the well, but he isn't hurt. What do you do? Yell down and ask if he has a life-threatening injury? And if not, we'll come back and get you after the Sabbath in a few hours so that we don't break the law. Really? Without words, Jesus is saying to them, just as you would not ignore what is yours and in peril, I will not ignore what is mine and in peril. The religious leaders wanted to know if Jesus could heal. Jesus did it. They got the evidence they needed because the healing was immediate and able to be observed. He had the power. They knew that only God has the power to heal. So where did this leave them now? Jesus silenced his critics. Either way, they may have answered would have put them in a position that they did not want to be in. As we explore all that Jesus did in this text, we see that if we are not careful, rules and laws can be elevated above compassion, making us legalistic and hypocritical. We must be like God and elevate people over rules. We must love his children, show grace and mercy, just as God our Father shows it towards us. These religious leaders and their observance of the Sabbath contradicted what is in the heart of God. They kept the rules and stopped caring about the people. Let us all always be willing to pour out love on our fellow sisters and brothers. Amen. Amen. That's the lesson, you all. I hope there was some good information in there for you. There's more if you get the study notes. There's definitely more in the study notes. But I pray you have a wonderful time in Sunday school. Let's pray out. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time of review together, Lord. Father, as we go to our separate Sunday schools, Father God, we pray that your Holy Spirit just meet us there, oh God, and that all of us learn and glean from you even the more, Father God, as we develop and deepen our relationship with you. We thank you, God, because you first loved us. We thank you. We praise you for all that you pour out into us and into our congregations and into our church families, Lord, whether they be near or far. We thank you. We praise you. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next time in Sunday School. Bye, y'all. Have you had an opportunity to visit our amazing swag shop? Stop by and check out great items for Sunday school and church school. This includes t-shirts, pouches, mugs, and so much more. Find something that you'll enjoy or something for your favorite teacher. Changing the way you see Sunday school with that Sunday school.